Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning for the early start, 8 o'clock. Uh, talking to some of you as you came in, I know it's been a, a fun week, but maybe this is where it starts to hit us a little bit, so uh, we'll put the pressure on Stephen this morning to really get us going. Uh, but we are thank, thankful that you're here, thankful that we've got another day of lectures and looking forward to it. Uh, I want to make just a few opening announcements, and then uh, Bruce Reeves will introduce our speaker, and uh, we'll also have an opening prayer. I want to rem remind you that we're doing 25% off store-wide at CEI Bookstore this week. So if you haven't been over and uh, had a chance to shop the full store, we would invite you to do that. I also wanted to announce again an upcoming event. Several of you have uh, made mention that you'd like to see more events like this among our brethren. And uh, Johnny Edwards is teaching a Bible study on understanding difficult scriptures in London, Kentucky. That's going to be July 20, 20th through the 22nd. And if you'd like some more information on that, you can email Johnny at johnnyedwards at gmail.com. If you want to ask me about that later on, I'd be happy to share that information with you um, if you don't have a chance to write it down right now. Um, and then also wanted to mention uh, that you be sure to sign up for our email newsletters uh, this week while you're here. You can do it easily at truthbooks.com. Uh, just by going to the bottom of the home page and sign up there for Truth News. And uh, we'll send you at least weekly emails with the latest on what's going on with the bookstore and our publications and uh, other information as well. Um, and then one other thing, the drawings in the back. Athens Bible School uh, has a table where they're, all, they're giving away some uh, bags and such. And then we have our uh, entry to win uh, door prizes as well. We have a few of those left that will be given out. Uh, probably one or two today and one or two tomorrow. So I want to encourage you to sign up for those. Had uh, at least one gentleman tell me, I've never won anything when I handed him his. I said, we well, can't say that anymore. <laughs> now, now you've won something. So I want to uh, let you take advantage of that. Uh, but before we cut too long into the hour, we'll turn it over to Bruce, and then we'll have an opening prayer as well. Good morning. I told somebody we found out who the elect of God is at 8 a.m., so... It's good to, <laughs> good to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, uh, the question that will be discussed this morning, does the physical nation of Israel still play a role uh, in God's plans? That is uh, an issue and a question that we all have had to deal with. It is a very predominant thought in the religious world and vital for us to consider. We have Brother Stephen Russell with us this morning. Uh, I first met uh, Stephen when he and his family were worshiping uh, with the congregation in North Gardendale in the Birmingham area, and I had hair and I was skinny. That's how long ago it was, and have always enjoyed being able to be with him. Uh, he is a native of Birmingham, worked with the congregation in Pleasant Grove, Alabama, and as well the Southeast Church of Christ in Montgomery, Alabama. And, of course, presently works with the Pepper Road Church of Christ. And I know that uh, we can look forward to hearing from him from the Word of God. I know Brother Stephen to be a devoted Bible student and a faithful preacher of God's Word. And so we look forward to hearing from him. And I want to encourage you to give your attention to him. Brother McAllister, who serves as one of the elders um, in, at the Olson Park Church of Christ, where actually Brother Kyle Pope preaches, is going to come forward now. And he's going to lead us uh, in a word of prayer as we prepare our minds for the study of God's word. Shall we bow together? Our almighty heavenly father, we bow before you at this time, thanking you for the blessings that you have provided to us in so many ways. We thank you for the creation that you have made, the plan that you have for us, the word that you have given us, the plan that you've revealed to us. We thank you for that word. At this time, we pray that you will bless us with understanding as we study the, the things that you have given us. We pray that you will give us understanding so that we can, first of all, know thy will, but we pray that you will help us to know these things, that we may be a light to the world, to be able to explain and to show. We pray for wisdom as we 
do study your word that we'll be able to apply it as you would have us to do to teach those around us. We pray that you give us courage to continue to do as we should, to speak when the opportunity arises and to look for opportunities to do good. We pray that you will continue to bless these men that will be speaking today. We thank you for the, the blessings and strength and health that you have given them, and we pray that you continue to uh, give them such in the future as they continue to do thy, thy work and, and strive to do thy will. We pray that you will continue to bless us with opportunities. Please strengthen us and help us to do thy will. In Christ's name. Well, I'm very thankful to be here this morning and thankful for the presence of each one of you and uh, the opportunity to talk about these things from God's Word. Um, I want to make mention in advance that um, I have uh, unfortunately overcommitted myself, and so I will be exiting stage left here immediately after this to get back on a plane to go somewhere else. Um, and so as I, I told the brethren um, at Pepper Road on Sunday, I'm not actively avoiding any of you, but I am passively avoiding you so that I can get on to the next appointment. Um, our question, does, physical, does the physical nation of Israel still play a role in God's final plan, um, is one that um, is, is wrapped up with premillennialism, obviously. And premillennialism is a doctrine that um, was always on the fringe when I was growing up. Uh, it was not maybe the most common thing I heard, but it certainly was there. Um, it, it, it sort of made its way into popular culture almost uh, as I was a teenager coming out of high school and into college with uh, you know, movies actually being made and so forth representing that viewpoint. But uh, it was almost comical. I mean, the, the world sort of made fun uh, of this view. And and you, you can really struggle to sort of find a, a scholarly presentation of premillennialism because it's, there's, a, there's kind of a, a facade of silliness uh, on top of it. But there are serious students uh, of the Bible who believe this. And, and I think we do well not to just go to the Hal Lindsey's uh, and uh, the, the Jenkinses, the guys who are writing, uh, you know, the popular fiction and so forth that represent this view, but go find a serious um, defender of this notion so that we can know what they're saying uh, in its most serious form. And so I've tried to do that as we're looking at this question today. The question waxes and wanes with the political turmoil in the world. Um, and, uh, and so as the Middle East tensions heat up, as they invariably do from time to time, this question rises to the surface again and again and again. And so um, we are in one of those moments now, I think, and, and maybe this question is, is more on people's minds uh, than it, it might typically be. It's an open door for conversations. Um, you know, I know, uh, I remembering back to 2001, September 11th, uh, my wife was a school teacher, she was a history teacher, and everyone knew she was a good Bible student. Lots of doors open, lots of people saying, what's going on here, what's happening here, what does the Bible say about this? And of course, the short answer was, not much, uh, but in another sense, a whole lot. And so uh, we can use that uh, as an opportunity. Well, as we are looking through here <clears throat> at this question, and just thinking in the early stages of it, um, the question is not, uh, is not an answer to all of premillennialism. If we answer this question, we haven't answered all the issues with that doctrine. But it is at the core of that doctrine. Um, Rari would say the crucial issues in relation to premillennialism are twofold. Does the Abrahamic covenant promise Israel a permanent existence as a nation? If it does, then the church is not fulfilling Israel's promise? And two, does the Abrahamic covenant promise Israel permanent possession of the land? If it does, then Israel must yet come into possession of the promised land, for she has never fully possessed it in her history. 
And so he, he sets that as like, you know, one of the core questions that he thinks needs to be answered is he is making a defense of the doctrine of premillennialism. And so um, certainly while we're not addressing the whole, we are address, addressing one of the fundamental elements of that notion. And so it, it, we do well to be uh, well rehearsed in what the Bible has to say about Israel and what the Bible has to say uh, in implication to modern Israel, current Israel. Well, <clears throat> when you go and you start looking at what premillennialists have to say, the, the subject of how we interpret the Bible and whether or not we take the Bible literally is a, a constant refrain, right? Do you take the Bible literally? Well, it's a good question. Um, and in one sense, we certainly would say yes. But what they mean is, do you take every statement to be a literal statement? Well, they don't do that. No one does that. Um, but it's, it's, sort of a, um, it's, it's sort of a way to, to suggest you're not a serious Bible student if you don't interpret the Bible the way we do. You don't take the Bible's, Bible seriously. You don't take it at face value. And frankly, uh, you know, that's a question that we ask sometimes. When we're reading through some text and, and we see some plain language and we say, do you not accept the plain language of God's word? That's right, sure. And I think most <clears throat> people who believe and teach false doctrines believe that all they're doing is taking God's word at its face value. Calvinists believe that. Premillennialists believe that. They're just... They're just taking what it says, and they just believe that. Well, I think that we can see some inconsistency as we look at the way the premillennialists would do that. So, for instance, um, <clears throat> as you're looking at Matthew chapter 24, uh, which, of course, we're not going to get into in any great detail, but <clears throat> John MacArthur is, uh, makes a, um, a study of Matthew 24 in a series of lectures. He did a series of lectures called um, Why Every Calvinist Should Be a Premillennialist. And in that series of lectures, um, he goes through Matthew chapter 24, and he does it in other places as well. And instead of taking the plain statements, starting there with, with straightforward language and then working back into the figurative language, he starts with the figurative languages, uh, asserts that it is literal, and then comes to the literal statements and, and suggests that the, the figurative language means that the literal can't be literal. Well, let me just say, I don't know if I even said that very clearly. Let me, let me just lay out what he says here. He says, um, as he, he goes through Matthew 24, and he's, he's laying out how all of these elements are, are literal. They're pointing to, to literal fulfillment and so forth, the destruction uh, every image is literal. And then he comes to verse 34, which says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. He says, if 34, if verse 34 is to be understood with such wooden literalness, which I think is the very thing he wanted me to have earlier, but if, if it's to be understood with such wooden literal, literalness, the rest of the Olivet Discourse must be spiritualized or otherwise interpreted figuratively in order to explain how Christ's prophecies could have all been fulfilled by AD 70 without his returning bodily to earth. So essentially what he's saying is, <clears throat> if verse 34 really means that these things must come to pass before this generation passes away, then all of this has got to be figurative. And I'm like, you are not far from the kingdom, brother. You're almost there. Well, so I, I'm, I'm all for uh, their taking the Bible literally when it presents itself in literal ways. Take it figuratively when it presents itself in figurative ways. Take it as it presents itself, like we do in our conversation with each other. And I think a better question than do you take the Bible literally is do you take the Bible seriously? Uh, do, you, do you take it at its word in whatever way it presents its word? Well, not only do we need to make a distinction between literal and figurative language, but we need to understand uh, the way that the Old Testament and New Testament interact with each other, and specifically in the interpretation of figurative language. Again, MacArthur, <clears throat> as well as many other premillennialists, will suggest that you need to be able to, whatever case you're making from 
the Old Testament, you need to make without the aid of the New Testament. So that it, it can and must, in fact, be interpreted on its own without the aid of the New Testament. He says, it is not legitimate to say that the Old Testament is this oblique, mysterious, hidden book with all kinds of things that you can't know about apart from the New Testament. That is, to give the primacy of interpretation to the New Testament. This is what Walter Kaiser, great scholar, says is having a canon within a canon, having a rule within a rule. This then means that the Old Testament can't be interpreted on its own. That people who are writing it and reading it can't have any idea what it is that they're writing and reading. Well, I tell you, that <clears throat> John MacArthur is not a fool. John MacArthur uh, is someone who reads his Bible thoroughly. And so I, I am um, I'm baffled by such a statement as this, that someone could say the Old Testament isn't this mysterious book. How often does Paul say that's exactly what it is? It's full of mystery. And in fact, the mystery is revealed in the New Testament. Over and over, that's, that's what Paul says, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 25 and 27 is referenced here as an example, but throughout Galatians, throughout Ephesians, he's saying, here, I'm revealing the mystery. And it's not that it's like some, um, some, some coded, like Da Vinci Code type language or something like that. But it is foreshadowing. And it's foreshadowing that doesn't completely become manifest until you get to the New Testament. And frankly, the New Testament is not something that comes in um, after you, know, you have the Old Testament and it's written and completed. And then like you have uh, an addendum that comes in later. But rather, the New Testament is like getting to the last chapter of a book or the climactic chapter of a book. The Old Testament is going along, and, and what MacArthur is saying, it's sort of like saying you can read two-thirds of a book, and you need to understand everything's going on, everything that's going on before you get to the reveal. Well, of course, that's foolish, and the author of that book would be pretty upset if you stopped there. And in fact, he might be pretty upset if you started trying to interpret the first chapter of his book until you got to the end. Because once you get to the end, you're going to go, oh, that's what he was referring to back there in the first chapter. I wasn't sure about that, and now I understand. When he says you should not give primacy of interpretation to the New Testament, what if you read through a book, you get to the end, and it really, it really shifts everything as they reveal who did it or whatever, you know, who the bad guy is or something. And, and you, you see that shift, but you refuse to allow that final reveal to change anything you thought earlier. Well, you'd be a fool, and you wouldn't be a very good reader. So, yes, primacy goes to the final revelation of God in which he reveals the mystery, brings all the pieces together. Uh, and, it, and, and so that's how the New Testament and the Old Testament work together. As far as <clears throat> him saying that uh, this, this, this means that the Old Testament can't be interpreted on its own and that people who are writing it and reading it can't have any idea what it is that they're writing and reading, it's exactly what I think is true. That there's a great many things that are being written in the Old Testament where they certainly do not have full knowledge. Back in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and beginning of verse 10, it says, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. In these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So not only does he say that the people writing those things were trying to figure it out, but, but angels wanted to know more about this. I'll tell you what, if, if angels are wondering what the end of the story looks like, then what about us mere mortals? <laughs> we need the rest of the story. I, I think of a place like 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where Paul references back to the crossing of the Red, Red Sea 
uh, as a representation of baptism, the, the manna as the bread of heaven, and, and most uh, maybe profoundly the rock as Jesus Christ. Do you suppose that as Moses was doing that, that he understood all of that and he, he got all those connections? I'm, I'm not sure I still quite grasp all of them. And so, yes, yes, they were walking around with limited glory. And that comes to its fullness when we do reach the New Testament. Well, <clears throat> this uh, question that we're looking at, um, it, it involves the promises made to Abraham, of course. We start there with interpretation. And let me just suggest we almost always need to start there when we're having a disagreement about what the Bible says. Because if, we don't, if we're not reading the Bible the same way, we're not going to be able to come to an agreement. But the, the issue is how we look at these promises, how we look at the fulfillment, and what the Bible says about the fulfillment of those promises. And of course, those promises begin to be spoken to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 through 3. We summarize those promises as land, nation, and seed. They are reiterated to Abraham several times throughout his life in the next chapter, in chapter 13. Chapter 15, they're repeated with emphasis as the covenant is, is uh, sealed between God and Abraham there. Chapter 17, again, they are repeated. And there's, there are fingers that come out from those main three promises, land, nation, seed. But those are the core of the promises that are made to Abraham. And so the land promise is uh, described as this land in Genesis chapter 12. As Abraham is standing in that land, he is looking at that land, and God says, this is it. This is the land that I'm going to give uh, to your descendants. Later on in chapter 15, as, as we get more detail of the promises, he uh, expands that boundary from the river Egypt up to the river Euphrates. This would be one of the elements that a premillennialist would hang his hat on in saying the Jews never actually possessed, or rather never actually inhabited fully the land from Egypt to the Euphrates. And so that's sort of a, uh, a place where they say, here is why that has never uh, fully been realized. So that's the land promise. The second promise uh, that is made to Abraham is that he would be made into a great nation. And of course, uh, the, that would number um, more than the stars of the heaven, the sands of the sea. And that at a time in which he and his wife up to that point did not have um, children. And then finally, there is the seed promise, promise that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. Now, most people will suggest that the seed promise is the spiritual fulfillment. Premillennialists will generally um, concede that the spirit that the, uh, the seed promise is fulfilled spiritually through Jesus Christ. But even there, I think we have some disagreement. We're going to come back to that in just a moment, but I just want to note this, this tension between um, uh, premillennial, premillennialists' view of, I do not like saying premillennialists this many times in one speech, but anyway, their view of the seed promise and really most of the rest of the religious world. Walverd, uh, who is probably one of the mo more serious premillennialist scholars, says this. He says, as a general promise, that seed promise, it is probably intended to have a general fulfillment. Abraham himself has certainly been a blessing to all nations and has the distinction of being honored alike by Jew, Mohammedan, and Christian. The seed of Abraham or the nation of Israel itself has been a great blessing as the channel of divine revelation and the historic illustration of God's dealings with men. The seed of Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, has also been a blessing to all nations. The blessing bestowed includes not only the salvation of many, but the revelation of God, the revelation of moral law, and the many byproducts of biblical Judaism and Christianity. He says all that in the course to say, yes, there's a sense in which Jesus uh, fulfills that seed promise, but he, he's not the real fulfillment. That's still coming, just like the land promise is still coming, just like the nation promise is still coming. And so even there, even though Paul very explicitly says he is the fulfillment of the seed promise, even that one is not one that they fully accept. Well, 
We're going to go through those three promises, starting with the land promise. So what does God's word say about that? Well, <clears throat> to begin with, um, we, we know that it, it wasn't fulfilled in Abraham's day. Stephen makes note of that in his sermon in Acts chapter 7 and verse 5. But even though it wasn't fulfilled in Abraham's day, we do have something of a time marker indicating when it would be fulfilled. In Genesis chapter 15, as the promises are being reiterated, again, Abraham is in the promised land. And God says uh, that his descendants would be strangers in that land that is not there, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. That's Genesis 15, 13. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, or the, yes, the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Well, so... That's, and that's, you know, Stephen rehearses that history in Acts chapter 7. And so he's saying, you know, you, you're not going to see this in your generation. In fact, there's going to be a few more generations. But four generations from now, he implies that this is going to come to fruition. Well, we continue on in the story then. We see uh, another time marker uh, in um, Exodus chapter 3. It says there in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 8, as God is visiting Moses at the burning bush, he says, So I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with, with milk and honey. That's, of course, the promised land, Canaan. To the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. So now we have the promise connected with circumstances. And I think this is an important point because the premillennialist, who's so literal, we take it literal, the, the promise is made alongside other promises, right? How will I give you the land in this way? It will be in deliverance of, of you from slavery, from Egypt, and it will be bringing you into a land, and here are the peoples that I will run out before you as I'm fulfilling this promise, so if I'm to interpret the Bible as the wooden literalist that they would like me to be, then I guess we've got to go figure out how to re, um, revitalize the nation of the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites because they've got to be driven out at the time that God is fulfilling this promise. And of course, Israel's got to go back down to Egypt because that's part of it as well. And, and they want to divorce that and say, oh, well, that, that doesn't have to be part of the scenario. Why not? Why, why can only one part of that promise be fulfilled? Maybe they would say, well, the other part, it's, it's been fulfilled, which that would show some inconsistency as well. Because that's the very foundations of why they say it hasn't been fulfilled. Well, of course, we, we go through that history. He does bring them out. He brings them up to the promised land in Numbers chapter 13. They refuse to go in, wander in the wilderness for four 40 years, and then Joshua leads them into the land. And, and in the book of Joshua, we, we see the conquering of the peoples, and we see Israel coming victoriously, um, uh, coming out victorious in that conquering. And in Joshua chapter 21 and verse 43, the, the, the summary of all of that is this. So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they possessed it and lived in it. Well, that's, that's the inspired statement, right? That's the inspired summary of what happened. God did everything that he said he would do. Well, Walverd says with regards to that, he says, um, the statement of Joshua 21, 43 through 45 must be understood as teaching that God on his part was faithful, but that the children of Israel did not enter into their possession. So, God was faithful in fulfilling. Well, then we've just got to redefine fulfillment. And that's what they do. But incidentally, let me just say, Walvard's language doesn't even hold up because it says not only did God fulfill it, it says they possessed it. So it's both sides. You see, he did his part, and in a sense, in all the sense that matters, they did their part. They possessed it. 
Now, we know that they did not uh, completely drive out the peoples and that they uh, continued to struggle because they did not fully receive God's promise in that way. Uh, and, yet, um, and yet, God could still say it has been done even if they uh, did not receive it as fully as they ought to have. That brings us to um, kind of an, uh, a side point here, parentheses that we need to address, and that is the nature of conditional promises. As, as Walford was working through that passage in Joshua chapter 21, um, he, he made a point that you, you cannot say that the promises to Israel are conditional. MacArthur goes much further, and this is where he ties, he really ties premillennialism to Calvinism. Um, he says, they make perfect, perfect amillennialists. Now, they in this context is people like us, people who believe promises can be conditional, and, and in fact, almost always are conditional. He says, they make perfect amillennialists. It's a perfect setup for them. God doesn't choose you, you choose him. You can choose him and then not choose him, and then choose him again, and then not choose him. You make the decision, and so all the promises of God are conditional on you. Amillennialism really seems to fit them. But not us who live and breathe the rarefied air of sovereign grace and election. I tell you, that phrase right there, it conjures up an image of a man standing on top of a landfill saying, come smell the fresh air up here. But he says it makes sense for their theology. Israel sinned, you're out. Israel sinned, the promise is canceled. Israel disobeyed the law, you're done. Israel crucified the Messiah, that's it. You forfeit everything and God gives it to somebody else, namely the church. His whole point in that series of lectures is if God's promises to Israel are conditional, then his promises to us are conditional. And I just say to that, amen. But he says God's promises to us cannot be conditional. And therefore God's promises to them cannot be conditional. He goes on in another sermon to say uh, in that same series. He says you will, you will not find a statement about Israel's disobedience, apostasy, rejection of Christ. Bringing about the forfeiture of their salvation and the kingdom of Christ. All I can say is if you're not looking for it, I guess you won't. But you can find it everywhere. Uh, not, and not just in the New Testament as we see passages like Matthew chapter 23. Which distinctly indicate that their rejection of Christ is their rejection from the kingdom. But just going back through the Old Testament and in the midst of those promises. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 30. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 and beginning there in verse 15. And this language in fact is, is throughout particularly the book of Deuteronomy as Moses is making his speeches to the people, warning them as they enter into the land. But, but note here, in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 15, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. And that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey... But are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live and you and your descendants by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land with which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. We go on to Joshua chapter 23, where Joshua is giving his farewell address. And he talks about that, that that they would prosper if they would, if they would obey. And he's repeating some of these things that they, they would be destroyed if they did not. And that is the very particular refrain of the prophets. As they begin to come to Israel and they say, this is what's coming. What is coming? Exactly what God says was, was going to come. 
He said he would do this if you disobeyed. You disobeyed, he's going to do this. And it means that he's faithful. When God judges his people, he is faithful to his word. He will be faithful to his word. I'm sorry, there was a line there. It looked like 955 and I was about to panic. So Sorry. He, he, will, he will be faithful to their faithfulness. But he will be faithful to their unfaithfulness as well. And so, absolutely, there are statements littered throughout the Old Testament. And, and I feel like the premillennialists are sort of like those people in Ezekiel and Jeremiah who's like, can't happen, can't happen. God, God won't let these people go. God won't destroy this temple. And they are the fools of those books. And it is Ezekiel and Jeremiah who set them straight and say, God, and, and it's not until they're, they're looking at the smoking ruins. And even then, I'm, sh- I'm still not sure some of them get it. And we have seen God's judgment on Jerusalem, and we have seen it again, and we have seen it in final ways, and yet they're still standing around. Not one stone is left upon another, and they're still saying, I I don't know. I don't don't think he's going to do it. He's done it. He has rejected them. Well, the seed promise, um, looking at the seed promise, I want to say a few words about that. We're skipping over the nation promise because we're going to come back to that in just a moment. And the seed promise, <clears throat> this is where we generally uh, say, here's the spiritual. We've got land nation, those are physical, and then we've got the seed promise, and it's spiritual. I, I want to suggest to you uh, that maybe it also is physical and spiritual. As we look at um, that promise that is passed down uh, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, the seed promise is particularly grabbed hold of and passed down then to Judah. Later on in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David is identified as the one who through the one who the promise would be fulfilled through. And so David would rule as king and build a house for God. That brings in Solomon. And when Solomon comes in as the prince of peace and the son of David, and the one who does indeed build the house of the Lord. In the dedication of that temple, Solomon borrows the language of 2 Samuel chapter 7 that brings that promise to David and now applies it to himself in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verses 19 and 20. Later on in his speech at the dedication of the temple there in chapter 8 and verse 56, he says everything that Moses said, everything that Moses promised has been fulfilled. And I think he's right in the sense that every physical aspect of that promise has been fulfilled at this moment this zenith of Israel's existence Solomon is the physical type that brings to fruition what God said would happen to Abraham we have the nation we have the land and in fact we have the seed but none of those things are the ultimate fulfillment they are all as we find out, types and shadows. And just as I believe that Solomon can be the physical, uh, the, the physical fulfillment of that seed promise, I think that we today, the church, is the spiritual fulfillment of the nation promise. And we await yet the spiritual fulfillment of the land promise as we are looking to go to our promised land that is much greater than the one that they inhabited. Well, let's look at the law. The law and its um, uh, place in this question is is not as uh, thoroughly uh, advocated as some other elements. But it is advocated by some, particularly how Lindsay um, says with regards to premillennialism. The main points are these. First, there will be a reinstitution of the Jewish worship according to the law of Moses with sacrifices and oblations in the general time of Christ's return. We must conclude that a third temple will be rebuilt upon its ancient site in old Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be the spiritual center of the entire world and all the people of the earth will come annually to worship Jesus who will rule there. Others try to build a case that it's not going to return but that in fact in in a sense it's never left because the uh the law of christ really only applied to gentiles and that jews were supposed to remain 
under the Old Testament law until Christ returns, and then it will be uh, not, not so much reestablished, but broadened from its continued practice. Well, I think there are some very straightforward answers to this and, uh, and some beautiful truths that respond to this. Often we, we spend our time um, pointing out that the law has been set aside, and rightly so. We, point, we turn to passages like Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. It's been nailed to the cross. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13, chapter 10 and verse 9, um, showing that, there, that the old covenant has been made obsolete, that it's been replaced by a new covenant in Christ. And we see all of those things, and I think those are valuable and helpful things to note. But, but I think if we're not careful, um, we leave out some of the most important aspects of that. It's not just set the old law aside and now we can focus on the new, but rather uh, what, what strengthens that is realizing the, the role that the law still plays. You know, what, what is its role today? Well, its role today is, is that as we look at it, it points to Christ, that Christ is the fulfillment of that law. In, in Matthew chapter 5, as he's being accused of setting aside the law, that's his response there in verse 17, that he did not come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. In what way does he fulfill the law? In every way. Uh, he fulfills the law, though, I think most beautifully in that he he represents all the beautiful truths that the law implied. Sacrifices. You go through in, in the book of Leviticus and you start studying about the burn offering and the grain offering and the peace offering. You, you, you see the details there and you, you look at what's being represented there and you, you, you continue on the guilt offering and the sin offering and you see all of these offerings and you come to the New Testament and you have this single sacrifice. And as the Hebrew writer says, there's once for all. And can you imagine the jaw-dropping nature of that to a Jew saying, one? How could he accomplish all of that? Indeed, all of that and more. Because he's a better sacrifice. And so everything that those sacrifices represent find their fulfillment in Christ. They end up being shadows. Leviticus tells us about the priesthood. About the high priesthood. We come to Revelation chapter 7 and it says this priesthood is one that exceeds. Because it is the priesthood in the order of Melchizedek to whom Abraham paid tithes. And therefore this priesthood paid tithes to this priesthood. And so it's greater. It's a fulfillment. The Levite priesthood ends up again being a mere shadow. It goes on to define holiness. It tells us what it looks like to, um, to, to act in holiness. And we come into the New Testament and we see Jesus living out that holiness. Incidentally, what does perfect law keeping look like? Jesus. That's what that looks like. Sometimes we look at the law and we think, oh man, that's just, that's just rough going. There's some weird things. Jesus is what keeping that perfectly looks like, not the Pharisees. And so he fulfills it in that way. Incidentally, as you look at the book of Romans, chapter 12, um, we, we think that that's where Paul ends this argument and begins anew. I think he's continuing his argument. In, in Romans chapter 12, how does he lay out what he, what he tells uh, the people they ought to be doing? He says, sacrifice. That's what Leviticus starts with. Next verse, he says, separate yourselves, be holy. That's what Leviticus says next. And then he spends the time, more time than Leviticus, but it's the thing that they need the most help on, saying, love your neighbor. That's what Leviticus says. And so ultimately, he's telling these people who are trying to cling to the law, if you would follow the law, truly, you would get to Christ. And that's what he says in Romans chapter 10, that that's exactly where the law leads us. Romans chapter 10 and there in verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That end is not like he, he put a stop to it, but rather Christ is, uh, as the footnote in the New American Standard says, the goal of the law. Christ is where it was taking us the whole time. The premillennialists would say, well, let's turn around and go back. <laughs> and that's sort of what Paul's argument in Galatians. Why would you do that? Why would you go backwards? We've already gotten to where we were headed. 
And the law is the thing, if we're faithfully following it, that would lead us there. Well, <clears throat> looking then at the subject of the nation and the fulfillment of that, many um, of the references in the New Testament refer to the physical nation of Israel. There are, by my count, 75 references to Israel in the New Testament. And it kind of defines what it means to be a physical citizen of the Jewish nation, such as it was. It wasn't its own sovereign nation by this point. But Paul points that out as he describes himself as a physical Jew, for instance, in Philippians chapter 3, and he, he rehearses the, the qualities that make him a Jew. He is of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, uh, circumcised on the eighth day. I think the key elements there is, I am a descendant of Abraham. I am of one of the tribes of Israel, descended from uh, Jacob in particularly. And I have been circumcised. And on these two elements, the physical Jew hangs his hat and says, this makes me a promised child of God, which cannot be revoked. But in addition to those references to physical Israel, there are a number of references to spiritual Israel. Beginning in Romans chapter 2, as Paul is condemning physical Israel, unfaithful physical Israel, he starts talking about true Israel, real Israel. <clears throat> These are children of Abraham who are children through faith, as he would point out in Galatians chapter 3. That's the real relationship to Abraham. In fact, as he goes through his argument there and he re reaches back to Sarah and Hagar and makes um, uh, analogies from them, uh, he says, here you have Ishmael who is a child of the flesh. In other words, he was produced merely by the, the, the natural function of things. How did, how did Ishmael become a child of Abraham? The same way any, anybody becomes a child of anybody else. But how did Isaac become a child of Abraham? Through the promise of God. And that's how we become children of God. And so he tells those Galatians, Christians are the real children of Abraham. You're like the children of Ishmael. Can you imagine the offense? We're not Ishmael. I think you're confused in your genealogies. He says, no, I'm talking about spiritual genealogies here. And you descend down through Ishmael. Well, <clears throat> when this premillennialist looks at that, they're dismissive because they think, they think that's spiritual. They would say something like, oh, so you think, you think it's just it's just spiritual in its fulfillment. We're, so the church uh, is, um, is supposed to be representative uh, of, of Israel now. John Piper says that's too simple. In, in going through Zechariah and uh, whether those prophecies point to the church uh, or not, John Piper says it's too simple to say that since the time of Christ, the church has replaced Israel as God's chosen people. Even though that is true in a sense. It's not enough. It's not satisfying. I, I would suggest John Piper go read Zechariah 4.10. Who has despised the day of small things? You, sir, have despised the day of small things. You've looked around with carnal eyes and said, this can't be it. And God says, look with my lens. This is it. And so too often we make that comparison and we think that the physical... The physical is the real. The spiritual, it's just the spiritual. That's not the way the Bible talks about that. The Bible talks about that in Hebrews especially. Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 9, and he's talking about the tabernacle. He, he talks about that as the true tabernacle in heaven. The, the tabernacle that you could actually touch, shadow, copy. It's not the real thing. So, as we move into the age of the church, it's not just replacement theology... It is, we've come to, to the reality that God was pointing to the whole time. Well, very briefly, we're going to look at Romans chapter 11 and verse 26. This is one of the most quoted passages when it comes to premillennialism. And so all of Israel will be saved. What does Paul mean when he says this? Well, we begin by just tracking the argument through the book of Romans. And this is going to be the fastest study in Romans you've ever had. <clears throat> 
Paul says, Gentiles are condemned for their sins, so are the Jews. We're all in the same boat. Chapter 4 says, faith is the only thing that will save us. Faith in who? Jesus. You can follow him, you can follow Adam. Adam to destruction, Christ to life. You have followed Christ to life. You were baptized into him, chapter 6. Chapter 7 says, why would you go to the law? Don't you remember what it felt like? Let me just rehearse that for you. Chapter 8 compares and says you're thinking carnally instead of spiritually. And if you think spiritually, you'll realize that even though this, this in Christness will bring persecution, it will result in victory for us. And then chapter 9 comes. And he, and he addresses that sort of question that's hanging over. How could God dismiss Israel? And what he says is, if he were being just, he would have done it a long time ago. But he had plans for you. And so he didn't destroy you like he destroyed Edom. But you have been absolutely determined in rejecting him. And so he will. Though he wanted to make you a vessel of honor, he will make you vessels of dishonor. And then chapter 10 is like, but how could we have known? And he says, oh, you could have known. And he rehearses all those passages for them. And he says, in fact, look over at these Gentiles. They know, and if they know, then who are you? You have no excuse. Now chapter 11. Do you think that Paul just went through and told them that Israel's going to be destroyed and justified that destruction and then says, but no, 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 you're all going to be saved. Don't worry about it. That's absurd. He comes through and says, indeed, this does not mean that all of Israel will be lost. But it does mean that much of Israel will be lost. They have been broken off. But they can be grafted back in, just like the Gentiles were. And in verse 26, that's what he says. <clears throat> Romans chapter 11 and verse 26. So then, or rather, and so, all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverers will come from Zion. Look at the previous verse, verse 25. For I do not want you, brethren, to be, to be uninformed in this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The Gentiles have been ushered in, and so, like the Gentiles, Israel will be ushered in. How were they ushered in? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Whiteside makes a comparison to Acts 15 and verse 11. In which he says, we believe that we are saved through grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. I think that's what's being mentioned here. All Israel will be saved. All of Israel who is saved will be saved like this. And the and so is the connector there. Well, that leads us to the conclusion of our question. Does, physical, does the physical nation of Israel still play a role in God's final plan? God's final plan of for Israel pointed to Christ. All of it pointed to Christ. The physical nation of Israel today has as much significance as physical circumcision. And Paul says about that, there's neither circumcision, or there, for neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Thank you so much for your good attention. For an excellent presentation. I appreciate how he approached this subject. He didn't take the superficial televangelist as the basis of the discussion, but went to their scholars and went to their uh, learned men. And in doing so, read deeply, but held it up compared to the Word of God and, and noted when it doesn't harmonize, it must be rejected. And so I, we appreciate his reasoned presentation. We now will take a break. Uh, we'll be reassembled back at, at 9 o'clock, and so uh, be engaged for the next session. Thank you.
start getting back toward their seats. There's the microphone. We've got about one minute. Ask everybody to start making their way back to their seats for the start of this 9 o'clock lecture. As you're doing that, I want to remind you of a couple of things. Coming up at 11 o'clock today, we'll be having a men's session here in this auditorium and a women's lecture in the gymnasium. It is uh, right outside uh, to your right, my left, <laughs> down the uh, slanting hallway. Uh, pretty easy to find right there. So ladies lecture at 11 a.m. there. At the same time, there will be a children's class in the library uh, in the main school building. And you can see our staff for direction to that to get your children there if you'd like for them to join the children's class at 11. I uh, also want to remind you this afternoon that we'll have an open discussion, open forum, question and answer session at 2.30 and if you have questions that you would like to see answered and addressed during that time, I would invite you to write those down, hand them to one of our staff members uh, or Steve Wolfgang, who will be moderating that, and uh, we'll uh, do our best to have the panel address those questions at that time. Uh, but now we'll be introduced to our 9 o'clock speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Brother Bruce Reeves. Uh, Bruce, uh, I, I met Bruce a number of years ago, shortly after his, his, uh, his move to, to the Nashville area. My son and daughter-in-law worshipped with the congregation where he had just moved, and, and they called me and they said, uh, Dad, we got this really good preacher that just moved to work with us. And we're just loving his lessons. And so we worked it out so we could get together and meet together. And, and for the first time and uh, throughout the years, we've had a very warm friendship ever since. And Truth Publications is about to publish another one of his debates. The reeves Newbauer debate is about to come out. And we hope that every one of you will buy a copy of it. You will be happy to have it. Uh, it deals with the 70 AD question. That's a question that has become a very hot one all across the country. And one that all of us need to be studying and be prepared to deal with. And Bruce, Bruce did a phenomenal job in the debate. I was not able to watch every moment of it, but I saw quite a bit of it and was very pleased with the work that he did. And I know that you're going to be pleased at what you hear this morning. Bruce, would you come and speak to us? <laughs> Certainly it's a blessing to be with you this morning. Thank you for rising early and uh, being here to study the Word of God. Well, Job uh, asked the question that we all must ask at some point as we reasonably think about Spiritual matters, he said this, he said, if a man dies, will he live again? If a man dies, will he live again? Well, we know as Christians, as we look at the gospel of Christ, that Jesus is the answer. That Jesus Christ offers the solution to the greatest questions that we might have. When we begin to talk about some of the things we're talking about this week, sometimes there is the temptation, I think, for uh, people to have the misconception that that's just some, you know, academic conversation about the end of time and how much does it really matter? Well, it matters a great deal. In fact, I would argue that based on the writings of both the Old and New Testament writers, but especially as we come into the New Testament, that the final resurrection, the future bodily uh, resurrection is central to the gospel of Christ. As Christians, we do not believe in the annihilation of modernism, in the materialism of atheism, or the reincarnation of false religions of our day. We believe in the resurrected Christ. We believe in the resurrection gospel. But sadly, even among some professing believers who will tell you they believe in Jesus Christ, and they may even tell you they believe Jesus is the Son of God. There are those who are adamantly denying a future bodily resurrection, along with some other things. And that's why this is so central to the gospel. They're denying a future bodily resurrection for the righteous and the wicked. 
If you would turn your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I want to begin and, and make a point there that this is not a, a new teaching. This goes all the way back in principle to the first century. So when we look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, very well-known passage there about being diligent to show ourselves approved to God there in verse 15. Notice verse 16. There the scripture would say, Paul writing to Timothy says, but avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. It's a faith issue. I don't believe the point here is simply the concept or the notion that we're dealing with timing. How could they have thought that the resurrection had already passed if they had understood it was a bodily resurrection? I believe the problem here was they had distorted in their minds the nature of the resurrection as well. And that's the very problem we have with so many, especially our full preterist friends. And so as we think about some of this, I want to begin by just defining resurrection. And as we look at defining, am I, am I blank? Okay, all right. I want to define resurrection, whether it's up there or not. So there's three basic ways I want you to think about resurrection. And that is, as we look into the scriptures, we see the notion of a literal usage of that term. We see a spiritual usage of that term, and we see a figurative usage of that term. This is very important in our study of the Word of God. And so we want to notice some passages that I think will demonstrate exactly that to us. We talk about the literal use of the word resurrection, the reality that we have. As we consider that, when we look at Jesus' resurrection, that was not just a figurative resurrection, was it? No, it was a, a literal, bodily resurrection. And if we don't believe that, we can't go to heaven. And then there is our future resurrection. It likewise will be a literal, bodily resurrection. And so I want to think about a good working definition this is very important at the very outset. So what would be a biblical concept of a literal resurrection? Here is the definition that I want to submit to you. And that is this, resurrection speaks of a person being bodily raised from the dead to a qualitatively different type of light in which death and decay no longer have any effect. It is a transformation, and this is vital that we get this, it is a transformation of the whole person, body and soul, into being fit for God's eternal presence. Transformation is very important here. And so if we can keep that definition in mind, I think that will go a long way in helping us. Now someone may say, well Bruce, what about all those resurrections before Jesus was raised? And that's, that's a fair question. And I'm not saying they were not truly resurrected. I would say you can almost look at those as miraculous resuscitations. And what I mean by that is this. They were raised, it was miraculous. But what kind of body were they raised back into? They were raised back into a corruptible body. You know, Lazarus still had to die. He was raised from the dead, but he was going to have to die. He was still going to be in a mortal, corruptible body. And that's an amazing wonder and, and sign and, and miracle on the part of the Lord that confirms who he is. But yet the Apostle Paul would say that Jesus was the first fruits. So there's some distinction between what happened with Lazarus and what was going to happen with the Lord and what will happen with us in the future. Jesus' resurrection, once again, when you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, and we're going to spend a lot of time there this morning in a moment, is our first fruit. So just think about first fruits and harvest. We'll be back there, as I mentioned to you, in just a few minutes. And then there's the idea of a spiritual resurrection. We're very familiar with that. You think of our conversion to the Lord. 
And that old man of sin is put to death, and the new man is raised to walk in newness of life. The old man is crucified with Christ. We read about that in Romans 6 and Colossians 2 and a host of other passages. And then there is such a thing as a figurative resurrection. Nobody's denying that that I know of. I'm not denying that. Just to give you a couple of examples. Ezekiel's vision, the valley of dry bones, that's a case of a figurative resurrection. Now, I will say this to you. If Ezekiel did not already believe in a future bodily resurrection, why would he be using that analogy? But yet it is used in a figurative way that's very clear. He is expressing the the hopeless feelings of Jewish exiles and God's purpose to restore them as the house of Israel, as a nation. And we come to the book of Revelation. Of course, we know this in Revelation chapter 20. John's visions in the book of Revelation similarly describe souls who had been slain for the testimony of Jesus in Revelation 6, 9 through 11. But they were vindicated by Christ in their spiritual reign with him in Revelation chapter 20. And so let's think about figures of speech for a minute because I think that will be important as well. When we look at figures of speech, and this has been alluded to by several of the speakers already, but I want to reiterate it. There are those who say, look, every time we read about the Lord's coming, every time we read about resurrection." Every time we read about these things, it's just figurative. That's what the proponents of the AD 70 doctrine argue. And there are a lot of reasons why that's a real problem. First of all, it's not the case. Secondly, that's not how figures of speech work. In other words, the very thing they are denying is the, the real foundation of using an analogy or a figure in the first place. You think about our own figures of speech. As I mentioned to you, the figures are grounded in a reality. And so, figurative usages such as resurrection or coming or judgment are grounded in a literal reality of such concepts. And if there was never going to be a a worldwide judgment or a future resurrection or an actual personal and visible coming of Christ, how could any of that make sense? It turns the Bible into fiction and exaggeration, and that's all it will end up being. And so, yes, there are plenty of times when we have this figurative usage of these terms, but I would argue from Scripture that it's grounded in a reality. And if you don't have a literal coming of Christ, how can you have a figurative coming of Christ? The prophetic reliance on typology helps us to see that every day of the Lord points toward the final day of the Lord. Every figurative resurrection points toward the final literal resurrection. And every judgment of God points us toward the final worldwide judgment of the Lord. What about the Old Testament? Somebody says, you know, I've heard somewhere before, you just don't know how to read the Old Testament prophets. Well, no, I think the opposite is true. The very things we've been talking about. But let's, did, did Jesus know how to read the Old Testament prophets? I'd kind of like to know that. It was referenced last night by Brother Hallbrook, but when you look at, for instance, Matthew chapter 22, the Pharisees believe in a future bodily resurrection. wonder where they got that notion. But the Sadducees denied the future bodily resurrection, and they come to Jesus with this story about this woman who had all these husbands and what in the world's going to happen. And Jesus, in Matthew's account, identifies two fundamental reasons for all religious error, by the way. You do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. What scriptures was he talking about? Well, you know, he was talking about the Old Testament, the prophets. What verse did he appeal to? Do you know he appealed all the way back, and I'm sure you do, to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6. I am, not I was, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God's not the God of the dead, but the living. And by the way, when you die, your soul separates from the body, but it doesn't cease to exist. What really dies is the body, and God's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So there's going to be a resurrection. And that's called necessary implication, by the way. 
And so Jesus goes back to Exodus 3. Martha, when Jesus is having the conversation with her, and he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. What did Martha say? Why did she say it? Was this a new idea she found? Martha said, I know that he will rise again, talking about Lazarus, in the resurrection on the last day. Peter, when he's preaching on the day of Pentecost. When Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, he quotes from the psalmist to prove the resurrection of Jesus. And Daniel gave a wonderful definition of what resurrection is in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. And it doesn't matter to me whether you think it was literal or figurative because the figurative would have to be grounded in the literal concept. And the passage says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And those folks who were suffering during the Maccabean conflict believed in a future bodily resurrection. And so even if in various texts we're talking about the vindication of God's people, resurrection language appeals to a belief in the future bodily resurrection. But I want you to turn to the book of Acts with me, and then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15. Look at the book of Acts with me. Let's come over here to Acts chapter 24 and chapter 26. And I think this is really important to to pick up on. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 14, But this I admit to you, Paul says, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance, listen, with the law and that is written in the prophets. So I believe what's in the law and the prophets. Having a hope in God which these men Cherish themselves that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience both before God and before men. So these men already believed in a resurrection. And he's not talking about a figurative resurrection. Look over here in Acts 26. Look at Acts chapter 26. He says he had learned this, so then all, verse 4, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. I was a Pharisee, verse 6, and now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O king, I am being accused by Jews. Why, and really get this, why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? Ladies and gentlemen, if that's just a, some kind of figurative resurrection, this doesn't make any sense to me. What he's arguing is they're all upset because I'm teaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why are they so upset? They themselves believe there will be a future bodily resurrection. And so that hope that he talks about, why the, the, the Pharisees oppose the Sadducees, uh, the errors of the Sadducees, our hope of resurrection, the gospel, the hope, forgiveness, grace, all of that is wrapped up in one thing. And I want you to think about this. And this is going to help us in 1 Corinthians 15 if you want to go ahead and be turning your Bibles over there. Paul already had a theological category to put the resurrection of Jesus in. That's his point. He believed in a future bodily resurrection. And so once he receives conviction from the teaching of truth and realizes Jesus was raised from the dead, it wasn't as though he was like those Athenians who who mocked Paul because of the idea of a resurrection or like the pagans who denied that it could happen. As a Jewish man, he didn't have a problem with thinking about resurrection. It was focusing in and seeing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. And so, if you can imagine a bookshelf, and you have these different books on the bookshelf. Now, all these things, as you see them, are on the bookshelf. The bookshelf is bodily resurrection. And this is going to be Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 15 that we study this morning. What happened? If the bookshelf of bodily resurrection is torn away, how do you have the resurrection of Jesus? See? And that's what he's concerned about in Corinth.
So let's open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, the most thorough treatment I know of in all of the Bible regarding the resurrection, and let's speak of it. Now, as we get into this, I'm going to be contrasting what Paul argues and what New Testament writers say with um, our 80, 70 friends, and I know if we haven't done quite a bit of study and reading, and even if we have, that is a very disorienting doctrine and very confusing, and false doctrine tends to be that way, but especially when it's denying explicit statements of Scripture. And so, if you're going, okay, I don't know where Bruce is going or where he came from, that's okay. I'm not going to take it personal. I would encourage you, and you've been encouraged before, read some of those articles in the back of the lecture book. There's one in particular by Brother Don McLean, which I think in a very succinct way explains 8070 doctrine, but I think most of us have some understanding. It denying the future bodily resurrection is a centerpiece of the doctrine. And so let's, let's think about this uh, regarding what was going on at Corinth. The Corinthians, the Corinthians claimed to believe in the resurrection of Christ. We all have probably preached many sermons on the resurrection of Christ from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 19. But when you look at the text as a whole, it's interesting how Paul is doing this. He's starting with what they claim to already believe in. He's concerned about how long they're going to believe it, though. And so they are believing, I think, in the resurrection of Christ. But he says if you, if you adopt a doctrine which will lead you to deny that, you can't be saved. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's really where he begins they're claiming to believe in the resurrection of Christ while at the same time denying the future bodily resurrection of humanity. Now, our realized eschatologist friends, our 8070 doctrine folks, have to do something with these texts. And so while we understand that body sometimes is referring to the church, they want to go through 1 Corinthians 15 and other texts and say it's just talking about the church. And it's talking about Judaism, and in AD 70, the Lord came, and the Judaism was stripped away, and now the church was purified, and before that, the church was actually vile and corrupt. Now, chew on that one for a while. Prior to AD 70, the bride of Christ was corrupt according to this doctrine. That's heretical. But nonetheless, as we get into this, what are they going to say? Well, they're going to say, well, this is some kind of figurative resurrection and spiritual gathering of these old covenant Jewish saints and Gentile believers together in the body of Christ. And until that, they're these separate bodies. And so this is more of a Jew-Gentile problem and more of a Jewish problem than anything else. Well, let's talk about Corinthians for a minute. There's plenty of texts that deal with a Jew-Gentile problem. But you know, is this just referring to Jewish issues in 1 Corinthians? Corinthians? Well, let's go back over here with me real quick. 1 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23, he talks about the Jewish misconceptions, but he also talks about Gentile foolishness and the wisdom of the Gentiles. And we just come along here, 1 Corinthians 5, sexual immorality, which was very common in the Gentile world. And we come on now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 2. This is all it would take. You know that when you were, hmm, <laughs> you know that when you were pagans, this isn't just a Jewish problem. Are there some Jewish issues talked about? Sure. But you know when you were pagans, you were, you were worshiping idols. That for sure is Gentile issues. And so what happens is the historical background of Corinth and 1 Corinthians has to completely be fabricated in an erring way in order to get rid of what is clear to us there. Now let's, let's come back and, and think some more about 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What are the consequences of denying a general resurrection? And it's so important that we see. He's saying you have to hold fast to the resurrection of Christ. But what, what's really happening with Paul here? Well, he says in verse 1, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also 
you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, I know I shouldn't have to say this, but he died physically. He was literally buried, and it was a bodily resurrection. We'll come back to that in just a minute. So he is saying to deny one is going to lead you to deny the other. To deny the general resurrection leads you to diminish or to deny, listen, the saving power of the resurrection of Jesus. Can I ask you something? If the final resurrection is just, if the general resurrection happened in AD 70, it was invisible and it was figurative and it was all of that. How would a denial of that lead to denying the resurrection of Jesus? I don't think it would. Paul's argument is these are, these are inseparably connected. So to deny one is to deny the other. And that Jesus' resurrection body is the first fruits of our future harvest, our resurrection body. Holger Neubauer a proponent of AD 70 doctrine, has now said and said in our debate, he denied that the bodily resurrection of Jesus was the first fruits. Why? He has to redefine that because he's denying the future bodily resurrection. You see what he's having to do? That's what Paul was afraid of. That's what Paul was concerned about. And not only that, Our friends have to come to this text and get everything physical out of it, including the physical death being saving. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Paul goes on to say, listen, Jesus was really raised from the dead. There's not even a question about that. We have all these eyewitnesses, hundreds of them. He said the apostles saw him. He even says that he appeared to me also as one born out of due season. Paul was an eyewitness of the same Jesus the others were eyewitnesses of. Look at verse 12, though, and really, let's hone in on verse 12, because I think verse 12 is very helpful to understand Paul's argument. And what I want you to see in verses 12 through 19 with me is that in verses 12 through 19, there is that inseparable connection again between the general future bodily resurrection and the resurrection of Jesus. And they go together. That's Paul's argument. All right, verse 12. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Do you catch the general nature of that second clause? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most miserable or to be pitied. Now, you got to follow what Paul's doing. I know you are. So he starts out saying, you know, if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, this is brilliant under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, you can't go to heaven. And they're saying, well, we believe in the resurrection of Jesus. He said, but wait a minute. You're denying the general resurrection. That's the category that justifies believing in the resurrection of Jesus. And they're denying that. If you deny that, what are you going to do? You're going to have to redefine those first fruits. And now you're going to end up denying, whether you realize it or not, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And you can't go to heaven that way. And that's exactly where these doctrines that deny the future resurrection take some life. As a result of that very thing, there have been some very uncertain sounds coming forth from the full preterism camp. This is Steve Baisden. They don't much like this being quoted, but they won't take it back. <laughs> so, uh, until they, until they take, take it back, I'm going to keep quoting it. I want them to repent, and we all want them to repent. But this shows the conclusion, so here we are. He said, I genuinely feel sorry for those who can only see the physical, 
Our denominational friends that only see the water are exactly like my carnal brethren. That's us, because we believe in the bodily resurrection like Paul, I suppose. Which only see the physical death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He's talking about what saves us. How sad it is not believing in the real death, burial, and resurrection. He thinks, I suppose, that's AD 70. Why does he say that? Because they've redefined what death is. They've redefined what body is. They've redefined what resurrection is. And that's what false teachers do. They redefine the terms and control the narrative we've heard. But there's no denying Jesus was raised from the dead. Paul said, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? You can't believe in one without the other. These are inseparably connected. Let me mention this. And this is very important, that when we look, brethren, at the Word of God, that we see the, the story, the narrative of salvation. And certainly, there's discontinuity between the old and the new. We all understand that. But there's a sense of continuity in the themes that are developed and fulfilled in Christ. Well, here's what happens. When you, deal, when, when you have a perversion of these eschatological, I had, to, I had to work that in, by the way, too. Eschatological, end of time issues. It doesn't just affect those concepts. So let me try to illustrate that fairly briefly with uh, realized eschatology. And I realize not all full preterists are saying the same thing, but generally this has been the case, and, and these are the movements we're seeing. So you deny a future bodily resurrection, you deny a future literal coming, personal, visible coming, Brother Kay talked about uh, yesterday. You deny all that. It's going to take you, watch, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And we're going to be told, well, physical death is not really a consequence of Adam's sin. Are you wondering why somebody would say that? Well, let me show you why. Because by denying it is, in their mind, the remedy for sin doesn't include bodily resurrection. So they have to go all the way back and redefine all of that. And then you come up through the prophets, and that's how you read the prophets. And you come to Christ and John the Baptist and the New Testament writers, and that's how you read them. And the whole story of salvation is distorted. And so then we start hearing some, not all, tell us the first 11 chapters of Genesis is a myth. Or we're told, you know, it wasn't a universal flood. It, was, it could have been a local flood. Now, some full predators are trying to hang on to the universal flood, but it is in vain. Why would they say that? Well, because when you go to 2 Peter chapter 3, and they're trying to argue that is a local destruction of the city of Jerusalem instead of a worldwide judgment, what does Peter talk about in 2 Peter 3? The flood. And so everything's getting unraveled. We've been told, well, there wasn't really absolute forgiveness of sins on the day of Pentecost. That didn't happen until A.D. 70. Those people on the day of Pentecost who were told, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, had to wait until A.D. 70. And do you know the Apostle Paul was spiritually, according to this doctrine, dead until A.D. 70? So see, it's not just an end of time question, is it? The nature of the church and kingdom we have recently been told that there is no eternal conscious punishment in hell or second coming of the Lord or the end of the earth or the final judgment. And this world of sin is going to continue in its sin forever. So when we come back to 1 Corinthians 15, first fruits. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, first fruits. Verse 20, but now... Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. 
Again, we have first fruits. What are first fruits? It's the first of a kind. Now, this isn't rocket science or anything, okay? First fruits is the first of a kind, and then you have a harvest. And they have to be the same in kind. They can't, we all know that agriculturally. So whatever the first fruits is gives us a clear notion of what the harvest is. Let me go a little further with you. Look at verses 21 and 22. For those who try to say to us, well, you know, this is kind of those Jewish Old Testament saints being spiritually gathered together. By the way, the gathering, they want to make A.D. 70. I don't know if one time it's talking about A.D. 70. I mean, I'd be happy to look at that. I've tried to track all that down. But I don't know that it's talking about A.D. 70. Maybe you're talking about Pentecost in some different areas. And, of course, we're going to be reunited at the end at that gathering. But look there, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now, if this is physical death and bodily resurrection, that makes sense. It can't just be a Jewish issue. Where'd my, I don't know what I was thinking preaching without a handkerchief, if y'all have seen me preach before. That, that was sermon suicide right there, so. It can't just be a Jewish issue. Notice the typology. It's Adam and Christ. That's all of humanity. Somebody says, well, what about Romans 5? He's talking about spiritual death there, and he brings up Adam and Christ, and you're, you would be right. But we have verse 12, for in that all have sinned there. Follow. You don't have that in 1 Corinthians 15 because we're talking about a bodily resurrection. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. If that's spiritual death, we've got universalism. If that's spiritual death, for as in Adam all die spiritually, so also in Christ all will be made alive. See, that's not his point. He's talking about the resurrection Jesus is talking about in John 5, 28 and 29, that both the righteous and the wicked will be raised. Well, let's work on this text just a little bit. How does that notion that this isn't physical death works? Well, you get hung up right away. Look here with me in verse... Three, verses 3 and 4, that's Jesus. Is that physical death? Jesus died for our sins? Verses 12 through 17, was that physical death? Verse 26, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. That's still to come. That's physical death. Verse 32, come to verse 32 with me. How does verses 30 through 34 work if it's spiritual death? Here's Paul. Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Was he saying I spiritually die every day? I don't think that's his point. He's in jeopardy of physical death every day because he believes in the resurrection. Verse 32, if from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Then he says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals, and if you believe in the resurrection, it's going to change your life right now, and you need to stop sinning. Verses 24 through 28. We find out something else about this first fruits and this resurrection and all of that. Look at verses 24 through 28. To deny the future bodily resurrection denies God's sovereign power and purpose. He says in verse 24, now this gives the premillennialist and the full preterist a problem. Verse 23, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ, it is coming. Then comes the end. So... Not seven years of tribulation, a thousand year reign. It's just real simple. Then comes the end. But for our purposes, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, and when he has abolished all rule and authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, the last enemy that will be abolished is death, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he has accepted who put all things in subjection to him, And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all, and you can breathe now, and I will too. But what is he saying? He's saying at the end, Jesus, in the resurrection, is going to turn 
authority, rule, and power and present the people, and he himself will be subject to the Father. And that has nothing to do with the question of Jesus' divinity. He was div- divine before, during, and after. There's no question about that. This is function. This is role. This is God's purpose. But what I want you to see, if our 80, 70 folks are, are right, look at the absurdity we find them in. So at the end, which they say is AD 70, they say you don't have a fully glorified kingdom until AD 70. You don't have a fully realized kingdom, messianic kingdom, until AD 70. And so here Jesus is. He's not really king of a fully glorified kingdom until AD 70. And yet, according to them, that's the final coming of the Lord when he turns the kingdom that he just received back over to the Father. Guys, that's the quickest handoff in history. It's just absurd. The truth is much more simple and powerful and transforming. But you see, that just doesn't doesn't work. So let's get into verse 35. I only have an hour and a half to go. We're almost there. So don't panic. That is a joke, by the way. There's some folks here from Highway 65. Alan and Julie Finley were thinking, yeah, that's probably right. That's, That's probably right. Verse 35. Let's look at verse 35. He tells you what the questions were. Someone will say, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come? How are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come? Now, here's the dictionary of preterism. Death can't be physical death. It has to be separated from God and sin, which is not how Paul's using it here. Resurrection is just unification of Jews and Gentiles, but that's not how Paul is using it here. Body, and they fabricated this rule that's not a rule at all that says anytime the singular term body is used to a plurality of persons, then it has to be the church. There is a Greek word for that. It's the word baloney. Okay. It's the word baloney. All right. That's not going to work. So let's think about what we have in Paul's argument. So verse 35, someone will say, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come? They're making arguments. They're saying, we just don't see how that could happen. And if we don't see how that could happen, it can't happen. And if you're from a pagan background, that's the reasoning. If you have a Gentile background, that's the reasoning. And they would have had quite a bit of that at Corinth. Okay. Verse 36, Paul's real gentle with him. He says, you fool. (laughs) You fool or you foolish one. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. I know this is going to seem kind of hyper-technical, but the realized eschatologist says, well, you know, you have um, Judaism, and it progressively is dying gradually until you hit AD 70, and Christianity is progressively getting stronger until you hit AD 70. How does that work with this passage? It doesn't. Look at verse, look, look at the verse, 30, uh, 36. That which you sow does not come to life. It doesn't even have an ounce of life until something's dead. So that won't work. It does work with a bodily resurrection, though. So he says, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body, just as he wished. And to each of the seeds, a body of its own. So what's Paul really saying? He's saying, why are you saying this can't happen? You see it every day. It's a principle of agriculture. By the way, who created the laws of nature but the creator? But you see this. You take a seed, has the germ of life that God gave it, put it in the ground. Fundamentally, it decays or decomposes, and yet life comes forward. And when the life comes forward, when that plant comes up, it has different characteristics. It has a different appearance. There's a sense of almost transformation compared to the seed but do you get the plant without the seed no there's a union you know there i believe is what some have called a somatic union between this body and the next body that's why it's resurrection by the way but the resurrection body will have different characteristics and attributes it's not going to be just like this body nobody's arguing for that nobody's saying oh if i've got diabetes i'm going to have diabetes in eternity that's foolish 
Nobody's arguing that. that. That is a, and this is Paul's point, this is transformation, but you see this all the time. Not only that, we have the agricultural argument, but look at the creator's power. We're really going to say if God says he's going to do something, he can't do it? Because my puny mind can't figure out how he's going to do it? The God who spoke and commanded and it was done and created? Look here at verse 38. But God gives it a body just as he wished into each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts and another flesh of birds and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. What's he saying? He's just saying to us, God is creator. Think about all the different forms that he created. And he designed them for a particular purpose. And that creator has promised through Jesus Christ that we will be raised. Let me put it this way. Somebody said, well, Bruce, what if somebody, you know, their body's incinerated or they die in a fire or whatever you want to think of. I understand those questions come to mind. They come to my mind too. But Paul says, if God made me, he can raise me. It's that simple. God made me, he can raise me. That seems to me, he's, there's a real appeal or illusion, it seems to me, back to Genesis here. But verse 42, verse 42, look at this. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. Let's read carefully. It is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Let's think about that for a moment. Would you notice with me, as he brings this up, that he says the it that is sown is the it that is raised. Now, there's change. It's not so much exchange as transformation. But the it that is sown is the it that is raised. That's, that's a bodily resurrection. But it's the, the resurrection body is not going to be just like the body that was laid in the ground. It's going to be changed. And that's what the Bible says. Let me share with you a quotation I thought was good from a book by Michael J. Gorman. Sorry it ran off the page there. That's probably my fault. In fact, I know it is. He says this, he says, we must stress here one key point that contemporary Christians often fail to understand or try to avoid, that Christ's resurrection was a bodily resurrection. Paul was a Pharisee, not a Platonist. And he did not believe in the mortality of a bodiless soul. Bodily resurrection does not simply mean the resuscitation of a corpse, but neither is it merely symbolic language for Christ's ongoing existence in the church as his body or something similar. The resurrection is a bodily experience. That sounds kind of like Paul. So, if you'll notice with me, when we look at verses 42 through 44, what are the changes? It's sown a perishable body but it's raised an imperishable body. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown in natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body. There's a spiritual body. Now, sometimes we let Hollywood dictate our theology, I think. And so we th when we hear spiritual, we think ghostly, you know, and, and uh, in, in, invisible and all these things. I don't think that's Paul's point. Paul's point is a natural body our bodies function in a natural realm. A spiritual body, our bodies have been transformed to function in the spiritual realm. This body as it is right now with its weaknesses and sickness and all of the vestige effects of consequences of sin in this world can't function in the spiritual realm. But Jesus' resurrection shows me there will be a transformation and we will participate in this resurrection so we can. We'll be functioning in the spiritual realm. So the contrast is not so much between form and no form, but us functioning in a particular realm. And if spiritual body is not 
If spiritual body in our minds is equivalent to a bodiless spirit, that's not what Paul is saying. And if he wanted to say it, he wouldn't have used the word for body. But it's a different body. It's, it's distinctive. It's been transformed. It's been changed. Look at verse 45. He says, we'll be like, Jesus has a glorified body. We'll have a glorified body like his. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. That, there's so much in that verse. So our souls have been redeemed, but I, Romans 8 says our bodies will be transformed. It says our bodies will be transformed. This is not speaking of the church. Look at Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21. Who shall change our vile body or humble body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Now, I want you to hang with me. The pred full preterists say, well, that, that's the church stripping away Judaism and then becoming the pure church. That won't work there either. Listen, Jesus glorified body there. And by the way, this destroys their fabricated rule. Jesus glorified body already existed when Paul was writing this. He wasn't waiting until A.D. 70. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like in his glorious body and the hour are not a bunch of Judaizers. Those folks are dogs, Paul said. So the consequences that would say we have uh, two churches or three churches, people weren't really forgiven, that's not what's here. And by the way, come back to 1 Corinthians 15, come down to verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. We're told, well, that's forgiveness of sins. No, they were already forgiven. They were saints. They were justified. They were washed, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. So this can't be a spiritual change. It has to be a bodily change. And he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will put on the imperishable, and this mortal will put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your Sting. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, he cites from Hosea and Isaiah. I don't restrict Paul to my shallow understanding of Hosea. I understand the fullness of Hosea from the New Testament writers. That's how, that's how we read Scripture. To say, well, Paul couldn't mean that because I don't understand how Hosea could mean that. No, Paul is showing me the fullness. And it's powerful. And I'm going to run through these two passages faster than I ever have. I promise you. But we've got to see two texts real quick that, that destroys this and then we'll bring it. Bring it home. 2 Corinthians chapter, or 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is where the absurdity just gets worse and worse with the doctrine denying the truth. You know, I know you thought 1 Corinthians 6, 13 through 20 was a warning about sexual immorality, but our full preterist friends say, no, it's talking about the church. What? Yeah, that, it's spiritual adultery. We're writing to people coming out of paganism. Let's read it. He says, verse 13, food is for the stomach and the stomach's for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for sexual immorality. Is he saying the church isn't for sexual immorality? No kidding. No, he's talking about the body. He says, God, God cares. He's not indifferent about our physical bodies and how we use them. Yet the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Why would he bring up, now think about this with me. Why would he bring up the resurrection as an admonition about sexual immorality if there's not going to be a bodily resurrection? 
Verse 15, do you not know that your members or your bodies, plural bodies, are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that one who joins himself to a prostitute is, the, is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. Look at this with me. Come on down. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. Is that outside the church? No. But this sexually immoral man sins against his own body. Can you see something with me? Look at verse 18. Is that singular there at the end of verse 18? Yep. Is it plural bodies earlier on? Yep. There goes the rule. That's physical body. And when we read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, by the way, I stole this off Kevin Kay. I want to go ahead and confess. But when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the argument, this is talking about old covenant, new covenant, just doesn't work. By the way, when God judges us according to what we've done in the body, is that what we've done in the church or what we've done in our earthly life? Yeah. Notice his language, earthen vessels, our body, mortal flesh, outer man, earthly tent, our house, this house, this tent, what is mortal, the body. If you wanted to tell me that there was going to be a bodily resurrection, how could you say it any clearer than that? And I don't know why anybody would want to deny it in the first place, so don't ask me afterwards why full preterists take all their positions. (laughs) I don't know. There can be a lot of things. So I want to end here. Are we walking by faith or by sight right now? Are we on streets of gold right now? Or are we looking forward to being in the immediate presence of God? My mother passed away several years ago, many of you know. Her favorite chapter was 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in the most anguishing last minutes, she passed with dignity and with faith. And many, many of you have had loved ones who passed the same way. She had full confidence in Christ and a future resurrection. This is going to be the super reversal of all of the cunning deception of Satan and of sin. And it's still to come. We're not living in heaven here on earth right now for sure. And I thank God for that. So what does this mean for us as we close? It means we should comfort one another. That's what 1 Thessalonians 4 says. So that when we experience the pain of death, instead we see the grace of Christ. When we contemplate the anguish of loss, we remember the comfort of God's word. That when we experience the heartache of suffering, we hear the sound of victory. When we shed the tears of agony, we see the faithful Savior as he will hold us safely in his arms. Let's join with Paul. Listen to him. Here's the so what. Look at verse 58. What does this mean? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Our hope remains. And our Lord is king. Don't give up. Serve him. Thank you. About a year ago this time, Bruce was doing a debate in Olson Park in Amarillo on the 8070 Doctrine. We had really hoped that the book would be available in time for lectures, but keep an eye out for it. You can pre-order it, and this material that he had talked about and so much more will be in that. We are right now at the top of the hour, so to keep on track, if you have to take a break, you may need to, but I think we may need to just go right into our next section.
In just about two minutes, I'm going to give folks just a chance to settle back in, but we want to shift around at what we normally do for the sake of a special prayer request. And normally we would end our assemblies each uh, day with a prayer, but we want to ask Mike Willis to come to the podium in just a minute and offer a prayer on behalf of Brother Matt Basford, who has been recently diagnosed with ALS and faces serious complications on a health issue in the future. There, there are options that perhaps may be available at Vanderbilt University, uh, and we certainly would hope and pray that venues may be open there that seem at this point dim, but it is vital that in times of struggle and sickness that we include God in our entreaty. And so let us bow at this point and pray. Mike, would you lead us on behalf of Brother Matt Basford? comments first please some of you may not know Matt as well as others and I'm not uh, as intimately acquainted with him as Steve Wolfgang and some others are but Matt is a very humble man you wouldn't realize some of his qualifications if somebody didn't tell you about him he went to the University of Texas I think it was and got a degree in to be a lawyer after finishing an undergraduate degree in journalism, I believe is the situation there. A few years ago, we were getting ready for another printing of Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs, and Steve said, Steve Wolfgang, could I bring Matt with me because he knows so much about printing? Well, I found out that he has been receiving uh, copies of the Bible to read beforehand so that they can say this is a good edition of the <laughs> scriptures and he has uh, writes reviews for significant publishers to talk to them about how good he, this Bible is, the paper it's used on and so forth. So he knew more about paper than anybody I know. <laughs> but you may not be aware of him as a musician. Uh, you are probably aware of his music. How many of you sing the servant song? Matt wrote two of the verses in the servant song. And probably the song that he's most known for is Exalted. We became aware of his unique talents and asked him to join the uh, board of the Guardian Truth Foundation or the Truth Publications, I should say, at this time. <laughs> I worked for the paper while we were going through name change. But um, we asked him to serve as advisor on our board because of his skills that he brought to us. It really broke my heart to see his post just a few days ago about contracting this disease. And so I asked his permission for us to have this prayer this morning and he said, who wouldn't want the Lord's prayers at this time. Our Father in heaven, we approach your throne of grace on behalf of our brother like it was in the days of Job when we know he did not know what was happening in his life. We don't know the background of what you're doing in the life of Matt. But we know you. We pray that you will give him the strength, help him through the days that lie before him. And may we be able to serve his needs, whatever they might be, as his brothers and sisters in Christ. In his name we pray, amen. It's a joy to associate with such good brethren as Brother Basford and others on the board and those that are a part of the uh, CEI team, one of whom, uh, one member of our organization with whom I work regularly, almost on a 
if not a daily basis, multiple times during a week, is Brother Kyle Pope. And he is a blessing in my life, and he is one with whom I have developed a deep friendship and great appreciation for his scholarship, for his commitment to truth, for his, uh, his calm and reasoned attitude and his patience with me uh, and his, his approach toward the scriptures. And so as we come to this central text of Matthew chapter 24, uh, Paul, we're, we're going to give uh, Brother Kyle the opportunity of, of uh, presenting the lesson of this hour and we look forward to his presentation and his discussion. And then if there are questions that you might have about the overall lectures or, or the, the lecture of this hour, we have the open forum that will take place this afternoon. Uh, and you're welcome to come back and offer uh, opportunity of further discussion at that time. But uh, with, with no further ado, Brother Kyle. I'd like for us to start with a text in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. With these words, our Lord introduces the most extensive discussion in the New Testament on the subject of eschatology. My assignment this morning is to ask the question, what is the focus of the Mount of Olives discourse? And there have been a few different ways that folks have answered that question. Some will suggest, premillennialists for example, that this deals with the distant future and things that have not yet even taken place. Others will go to the other extreme and argue that it solely concerns things that deal with what took place in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And then there's a third viewpoint that will argue that our Lord addresses both subjects. And I'll go ahead and tell you that that's the argument, that's the position that I will advance in this lecture. With respect to that view, there are a couple of ways that's been understood and interpreted. Many will look at verse 34 as a transition, a hard transition from talking about the destruction of Jerusalem before that to talking exclusively about final judgment after that. Others will argue, and this is actually a little bit of an older position, that our Lord moves back and forth between the two to contrast and to make distinctions between the two. And I'll go and tell you that's the position that I hold and I'll be trying to persuade you of in the lecture today. Now, as we think about this, let's start by understanding what text we are dealing with. This is an account that's recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. While Mark and Luke have abbreviated accounts, Matthew has the longest account that spans through chapter 24 and 25. It's important for us, I think, to note some of the things that Matthew includes that the abbreviated accounts do not. For example, the days of Noah comparison, the parable of the faithful servant, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, and especially the sheep and goats judgment scene that is recorded. Now Luke, as you'll see in the chart that's in the book, Luke will record certain similar accounts and put them in different contexts. But a couple of important things I think we should think whenever we are looking at differing accounts. First of all, we need to recognize that differing accounts do not constitute contradictory or erroneous accounts. Let me give you an example. The Gospel of John spends a whole lot more time with the last week of Jesus' life than do the other Gospels. Not a contradiction. Mark will address more the miracles of Jesus than the teachings of Jesus. Simply a different emphasis. But secondly, we also need to recognize that when you have abbreviated accounts, we don't have to expect that they're going to be synonymous in every detail with the more expanded accounts. And I think a classic example of this is Matthew chapter 19 when compared to Mark chapter 10. Now both record a discussion that Jesus has on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. But Matthew records an element of the Pharisees' question that Mark does not record. 
And so we should not be surprised that Matthew records the exception clause, while Mark will record a discussion later with the disciples. Now, what's the context of this discourse? In my commentary on Matthew, I spent a good deal of time looking at what we can know and discern about this final week of Jesus' life. And I would refer you to that. It's noted in the, in the book if you care to look at the details. But I believe this took place on the Tuesday before his crucifixion. And it's important for us to, to note that this happens after a long day of teaching that has taken place within the temple. And as we think about that, it is motivated by a few things that one may motivate the other. We recognize from our reading it's motivated by uh, the, the disciples' observation of the beautiful buildings of the temple. Now that itself might have been motivated by Jesus' praise of the widow and her offering and some statements that he would made during his day of teaching in which he talked about the house being left desolate. Uh, during this final week, each evening we're told in the scriptures that he returns back to Bethany at, in the evenings. And so he's on his way back to Bethany. And the Mount of Olives overlooks the Temple Mount, and it is there that this discussion takes place. We should note this is a private discussion. Mark will indicate a few of the disciples that were there, and it's unclear whether or not all of the disciples were privy to this or, or not. Now, let's look a little bit at this question that we read a few moments ago, because it is vital for us to understand the flow of the discourse and to think about the questions. Let's look at Mark's, and I'm going to step forward because I have bad eyesight here. Um, Matthew has the, the most lengthy account, and the way he words it is, tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Mark will put it just a little bit different. Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all of these things will be fulfilled. Luke puts it this way, teacher, but when will these things be, and what will the sign be when these things are about to take place? Now let's think a little bit about this. All three of the gospel accounts have the element of the question that we've used for the title of this series of lectures this week. When will these things be? Now, as we think about the context of that, having just said to the apostles that the time will come when one stone's left on another, I think we've got to conclude that this is talking about the events that would happen only a few decades after this, in which the temple would be destroyed by Rome. I think we must reject the argument that would say, well, this is totally talking about of future events that still haven't happened or some rebuilt temple because it would be in 70 AD that this would take place. And I'll tell you, this is a glaring flaw of premillennialism because they rely upon something that doesn't really mesh with the context. Now, the next element of the question, in our English Bibles, it's not quite as clear that it is the same wording, but in the Greek, it's exactly the same wording. And what the sign or what is the the sign. Now, I want us to think a little bit about this. The conjugation that this element starts with and I think suggests to us something important. We're looking not simply at one question, but at least two questions. When and what sign can they look to to anticipate that these things are about to take place? Now, let's think about this sign element of this. Now, Luke, remember, he puts it, what sign when these things are about to take place? But I emphasized a moment ago when I, when I read the element from Mark, when all these things will be fulfilled, especially the way it's recorded in Mark. He will have some elements of the discussion in the temple right before it. Mark chapter 12, verse 40, we'll talk about uh, condemnation. Uh, verse 25, we'll talk about resurrection. I think we have to consider that that may be an element of what's being described. Now, Matthew has the most lengthy element of the sign question, and it's twofold. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So let's talk first about that second part of this sign element, the end of the age. What's that talking about? There are some that have looked at that and said, well, this must be talking about the end of the Jewish age. Maybe some of you who are here this morning believe that. Brother Art Ogden 
in his commentary on the book of Revelation, makes that argument. Now, the problem is, if we look at texts such as we've talked about some this morning already, Romans chapter 10, verse 4, or Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, the end of the Jewish age properly took place at the cross. It didn't take place decades later in AD 70. I think we need to recognize as well that Matthew serves as the best commentary on how to interpret this. Of the six times that this phrase, end of the age, is used in the New Testament, five of them are in the Gospel of Matthew. For example, back in chapter 13, in the parable of the wheat and tares, we'll see this phrase used twice. Also in chapter 13, in the parable of the dragnet, it will be used. Now, in that context, you will have it describing the Son of Man sending out his angels. You'll have the tares burned up with fire. You'll have a separation of the wicked from the just. Now that doesn't seem to mesh with an idea that would say, well, this happened in the destruction of Jerusalem. Let's add to that chapter 28 and verse 20, that beautiful promise, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, are these talking about AD 70? Is he just saying, well, I'll be with you until AD? No, we recognize he is using it here of final judgment of the end of the universe as Brother Chris Reeves talked to us about yesterday. I think then it's most reasonable to conclude that in verse 3, he's using end of the age as he does in the rest of the gospel of final judgment. Now, let's think about the element of this question in Matthew's account that asks about your coming. And I'll go ahead and tell you, I'm going to spend most of my time this morning talking about this word and how it's used here, because in my understanding of this, it was this word that was pivotal to help me come to the position that I currently hold. Now, let me comment just a moment. I don't believe that's a mistranslation to say, you're coming. But when we use the term coming in English, we generally always think of the idea of movement and direction. And if we're not careful, we can bring some ideas with that to the text that aren't necessarily inherent in the word that's used. Let me give you an example. R.L. Whiteside, in his book, Doctrinal Discourses, he makes the argument that end of the age is AD 70 and Jesus' coming would be AD 70. And he says this, How could the disciples have asked about his second coming when they did not believe he would be killed? Now, do you understand his point? If they didn't know he's going to ascend and then come back, how could they ask about his coming? Well, that is assuming you're talking about movement and direction. Whereas our Greek word parousia or parousia, it refers to presence and location. Let me see if I can prove that to you. This is a noun that is formed from the preposition para, meaning beside or alongside, and the present participle usia, that is from the verb, the to be verb, a me. Now, if you remember from your school days, a participle is a verb form that has characteristics of verbs and adjectives that express qualities abstractly. In English, these are our ing words. Now, what, what this adds up to is this word literally means being beside. And when it's used in the New Testament most frequently, that's exactly how it's used. For example, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, not as in my presence, parousia only, but now much more in my absence. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10, his bodily presence, parousia, is weak, but his speech is contemptible. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 17, I am glad about the coming Parousia of Stephanitis, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. We'll see that Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 6 and 7, is comforted by the parousia coming of Titus, and not only by his parousia coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted by you. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 26, Paul longs to comfort the Philippians by his coming, parousia. In each of these instances, the idea of the actual presence of the one being considered is always inherent in the use of the word parousia. Now, I want us to recognize that add to this, we need to see that Greek literature affirms this. And you'll notice uh, citations of all of this in the book, and we're not going to go through a Greek class here 
But let me just offer to you a few examples. You'll see it's used of the actual presence of a military force by Thucydides. It'll be used of the presence of uh, protection that a king offers by his actual presence in Aeschylus. We'll see that those present to bury a dead body, the words applied to in Euripides. A friend's support by his actual presence is affirmed in Sophocles. We'll see that uh, this can be used to refer to the actual presence of either bad things in Euripides and Aristophanes or of good things in Plato. And it can be used in the plural to describe visitations of bad things, uh, which will refer to, to chance and Demosthenes. In each of these, we're always talking about something in which the actual presence of the thing being described is inherent, not a figurative use. And we'll see in, in Greek literature just the same way that we notice quickly in the New Testament. It'll be used of someone's delayed presence where they uh, wanted to see and speak to them in Sophocles or awaiting the arrival of someone also in Sophocles. Uh, added with another verb, it, it can communicate the idea of to hold presence as we see in the lexicons uh, in Sophocles. The arrival that's announced, this word will be used. And here's an interesting one because you'll see in Thucydides' and Dionysus of Halicarnassus, it'll be used in reference to someone's first presence or first arrival, which always seems to infer there's going to be another one. Bear that one in mind. Now, you may say, okay, why does that matter? Why are we going through all of, all of this? Well, here's the reason it matters. Matthew uses a word of Christ's actual presence as he records the disciples' question in verse 3. But that's not the only time he uses it. We're going to see that he then goes on and in the same discourse, three times later, uses this actual word. Now, if we interpret your coming as a figurative spiritual application to AD 70, we are not talking about an actual presence. We're using it figuratively or spiritually. And I want to suggest to you that from what I've been able to find, the survey that I've done, I, I can't find evidence of that. Not only in Scripture, but in Greek literature in general. I don't find this word being used that way. Nonetheless, this is a fundamental premise of the AD 70 doctrine that we talked about a good deal in our lectures so far. Let me give you an example. There are at least two books that I'm aware of, one by Russell, one by King, that advocate this position and use that term parousia in the title. I could add to this a third one. Preston in 2019 did a similar book, and he'll use that. Now, in those books, what they generally do is they'll go through and they'll look at various comings that are recorded in Scripture, and they'll apply this word parousia to each of those. But they never go through and explore what its inherent meaning is. Now, let me illustrate it this way. Within Churches of Christ, we have a battle we fight with the religious world over the idea of baptism, don't we? We recognize that in Greek, baptizo means to immerse, and so baptisma means immersion. Imagine that we were to write a book on baptism, and we went through and we looked at every place that Scripture talks about a use of water, and we applied the term baptism to it. It wouldn't work, would it? Now, clearly, there are times in which Scripture will speak of a coming of the Lord in which it is spiritual or representative or figurative. But my argument I'm making to you this morning is that that is never the case when the term parousia is used. In fact, the inherent meaning of the word precludes that interpretation. Now let's think about a couple of things that I think reinforce this. Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich will talk to us a little bit about this word and explain something that I think is crucial to our understanding of it. It could be used as a technical term. And here's how they put it, that it could be used of an official, um, it could be used as, a, as an official term for the visit of a person of high rank especially of kings and emperors visiting a province. And we have early attestation of this. Papyri will speak of the arrival or the parousia of a king. Josephus will use this word in this way. He will use it of a, the arrival of a king, of a commander, of elders, 
of ambassadors. Now let's understand something about that usage of ambassadors. It's not that the king makes a parousia through the ambassadors. It's talking about the arrival or the presence of the ambassadors. Interestingly enough, you know, the 8070 doctrine will argue that the Roman general Titus, the, the Lord came in his conquest of Jerusalem. Well, Josephus actually will speak of a parousia or coming of Titus, but we wouldn't expect him to, but he doesn't call that the coming of the Lord. Bauer and Gingrich will offer us a second technical way that this is used, and that is it would be used of um, the sake, it would be used as a sacred expression for the coming of a hidden divinity who makes his presence felt in a revelation of his power, whose presence is um, celebrated in the cult. And we may look at this and go, wait, Brother Pope, that, that is a, a demonstration, isn't it, of spiritual or figurative? Well, let's think about that. We recognize that there is no God but the one true God, and that these gods of the Greeks and Romans were false gods. But they believed that when there was something they perceived as a demonstration of power, that it actually reflected the real presence of their divinity. Now, Josephus will actually use this word a few times like this. For example, he will use it of uh, his description of the Israelites in the wilderness. And he will argue that the lightning and the thunder and even the dew demonstrated that God was actually, and here's our word, present in the tabernacle. Now, there's one he offers that's a little bit challenging. He is commenting on the account in 2 Kings chapter 16, 6, verse 17. And that's the incident, you remember, where Elisha, the Syrians come, and his servant is nervous about it, and the Lord allows a demonstration of the chariots and horses of fire. Now, Josephus, in commenting on this, says that it showed the power and parousia of God. Now, let's think a little bit about that. First, we've got to recognize Josephus isn't an inspired writer. He is expressing his opinion. This is not the Holy Spirit expressing that this was a parousia. But if we could accurately describe 2 Kings 6 verse 17 as a parousia of the Lord, this would constitute the only example I've been able to find in which you have somewhat of a spiritual or figurative or representative use of this. But that doesn't change the inherent meaning of the word. It still describes actual presence. But let's think a little further about that. You know, both Josephus and the biblical account of 2 Kings 6 verse 17 are describing a supernatural event. And most of us would all agree that when there is a miraculous thing that takes place, there's some measure of divine presence that is actually involved in that. Now, advocates of the 8070 doctrine, they don't argue that. They don't argue that there was a supernatural demonstration of God's presence when Rome destroyed Jerusalem. So they really can't take any comfort in this. Now, one last thing, and we'll move beyond this technical idea. Bauer and Gingrich go further to say that these two, used of leaders and used of, of deities, can sometimes come together. They can approach each other clearly in meaning, can shade off into one another. Now, what they're talking about here is... You may be aware that many within the ancient world would come to view their political leaders as divine. And there's an inscription I want to offer to you from Tegia that says this, the year 69 of the first parousia of the god Hadrian in Greece. Now, Hadrian wasn't a god, but I want you to notice what this reflects about how the official visitation of a leader, an emperor, came to be, be viewed with great significance. In your book, and here I project for you, some coins that are known as Advent coins. And you'll see the Latin word adventus here that is somewhat parallel to the Greek word parousia. And what these do, one is of Nero, one is of Hadrian, what these do is they mark when an official visitation of the emperor had taken place and it becomes a point of great significance. Now, how is that significant to our discussion of the Olivet Discourse. Well, if parousia inherently expresses actual presence, and if it is applied to 
the official visitations of leaders. The disciples question, what's the sign of your coming? It doesn't have to refer to something uh, that they knew would go away. It's talking about when his official visitation to fulfill those things he's been talking about in the temple would take place. They didn't have to understand that he would go away and come back again. Instead, they're simply wanting to know when those eschatological things that he's talked about all day will be fulfilled. Now, with that in mind, let's spend some time looking at what we see within the discourse. And I ask you to look for three terms that we've seen first in the question. First sign, then coming, and then in. Now, I want us to notice, and something important for us to think about as we look at the Mount of Olives discourse, is that Jesus really tells them a whole lot more about what they will not see than he does about what they will see. Or maybe to put it a little different, he will tell them the things that they will see that do not signal the end. For example, he says you're going to see false Christs, you're going to see wars, you're going to see famines, you're going to see pestilence, you're going to see earthquakes. But verse 6, this is not the end. Now I want us to think about that. He describes these rather as the beginning of sorrows or birth pangs. One of the reasons I hold to the strict transition verse is because verse 34 can't be a strict transition or a hard transition because you've got verse 6 already referring to the end before verse 34. Now, after that, we'll see then that there'll be persecution and apostasy and lawlessness. There will be the gospel being preached into all the world. And then we're going to see the word end used two more times before verse 34. Verse 13, for example, he who endures to the end will be saved. Then secondly, after the gospel is preached into all the world, then the end will come. If any of these refer to final judgment, we've had references to final judgment prior to verse 34. Now, if you're like me, you'll probably look at verse 13 and say, wait, wait, wait. Verse 34 is talking about the end of one's life. And that may well be the case. Uh, The parallel over in Luke chapter 21 verse 19 says, by your patience possess your souls. But there's another end that's mentioned after verse 6 as well. Then the end will come. This is after the gospel is preached into all the world as a witness to all the nations. When was that? Now I know we might well say, well, first century. Colossians 1, Romans 1, we'll talk about the gospel going into all the world. That's true. But the gospel is still preached today. Persecution still continues. Apostasy and lawlessness still continue continue. Now, what I think is a key to understanding what he's really pointing to is this phrase, abomination of desolation. I believe that this is the first identifiable thing he says that they would actually see towards the answer of their question. Let's look at what we we find here, and it's in uh, chapter 24, as he describes this abomination there in verses 15 and 16. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Luke will put it this way, writing, both both Mark and Matthew will use the phrase abomination of desolation. Luke writing likely to a Gentile audience, he'll kind of explain it more for them. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Now, what is this talking about? Well, notice with me that it's geographically connected with a specific place. They are, those in Judea are to flee to the mountains. They're not to go down to retrieve their possessions. This is a time that will be hard on pregnant women. In fact, it will be the worst time ever. Some have tried to connect it with Daniel chapter 12, but the wording here is interesting. It's the worst that nor ever will be. So I think that's interesting to notice, but the time is shortened for the sake of the elect. Luke will, in chapter 21, verse 24, say, And they will fall by the edge of the sword, and be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, 
What is this talking about? Well, we have reference to this phrase, abomination of desolation, that comes in a work that falls uh, after the book of Daniel, but before the New Testament in the historical book of 2 Maccabees. This is not an inspired account, but it describes persecution that took place. And reading from the King James Version, 2 Maccabees 1, 54, it says, on the 15th day of the month of Kislev, in the 145th year, they set up the abomination of desolation upon the altar and builded idol altars throughout the cities of Judah on every side. Now, know that at least part of what that referred to, and let me back up a little, I got ahead of you, sorry. Um, at least a part of what that referred to was the offering of pagan sacrifice on an altar in the temple. We know as well that during this period of time, you had uh, forced Greek religion upon Jews within that area, even to the point that they would kill those who circumcised their children. Now, I think I do need to back up for just a second because I wanted to make one point that I skipped over there. Premillennialists will look at this and even argue that this is a future event. And I think the context of Daniel, we, we have to disregard that view. Because the context of Daniel puts it during this period in which Antiochus Epiphanes, that Greek leader, was persecuting Jews during that period. And it is, it is connected with this defilement of the temple that we just read about from the books of the Maccabees. Now, um, as Jesus uses it here, I think we need to consider the context of Daniel does not describe two different abominations of desolation. So I think what Jesus is doing is Jesus is saying something like what happened in the period that Daniel was prophesying about between the Testaments is going to take place, and you look for that. And history records that Christians were looking for that. And in fact, when they saw that this was about to take place, Eusebius records that they fled from Jerusalem. And so Christians were spared that as they fled to the Perean city of Pella. And that being the case, I want us to notice something important. Our Lord doesn't equate the term end with the abomination of desolation. You remember, the gospel will be preached then the end will come. So it seems as if he kind of looks ahead, but then points to what they will see. Then when you see. I think that's important for us to understand. Now, let's go back to this word that I spent some time with, parousia. First time that it's used comes in the context after this in which it's talking about, don't believe those who will come along and pretend to be the Christ. In fact, let's notice what is said there in verse 27. He says, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming parousia of the Son of Man be. This is in verse 27. Now, don't miss the contrast. Unlike the pretenders, you know, that are going to say, well, here's the Christ, you've missed it. Unlike the pretenders, Jesus says, when that coming really happens, it's going to be unmistakable. And I think that's another reason that we have to reject uh, the idea of the 80-70 doctrine. The very fact that we're discussing or that people would say, well, could it have been the coming of Christ? Shows it wasn't. <laughs> because Jesus says when it happens, everyone is going to know. Now, again, if verse 34 is a hard transition that means what you'd have to do is take verse 27's use of parousia in a representative and figurative spiritual way. But again, I would suggest to you there's no evidence to support that. And in addition to that, that takes away the whole contrast. Because if it is something that, well, it's going to happen in an unseen way, it doesn't mesh with the idea of lightning. Now that leads us to something that many of us wrestle with, and that is the cosmological language of chapter 24, verses 29 through 31. Let's read it. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, 
And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels and with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one, uh, one end of heaven to the other. Now, let's think about this. And I'm sorry, I didn't have it up there for you. Many brethren will argue that this is talking about the figurative spiritual significance of 8070. Maybe some of you hold that view. Now, I recognize that often in the Old Testament, cosmological language will be used in a figurative and spiritual way. But as Brother Russell argued this morning, I think we need to recognize that it always foreshadows an ultimate reality. It's not, as Brother, Re Brother Reeves was pointing out, just some big exaggeration. Now, that being the case, we recognize that our interpretation of this has gone a long way to fight against the false doctrine of premillennialism. But do we have to interpret this in a figurative way in order to counter premillennialism? Now, 8070 proponents, they will take that and run with it. Because what they do is they'll say, all right, if you take it figuratively here, you should take it figuratively every place else in Scripture. And that being the case, I think we need to ask some things about it. First, let's notice that when these events are described, Mark and Matthew both describe them as happening after this. It's not that they are equated with the abomination of desolation. And I think that's important for us to understand. Now, does the flow of the discourse demand that we take them figuratively? Is a figurative interpretation consistent with how they're used later in the same discourse and also in the rest of the New Testament? And finally, what is the scope of what verse 34 describes and what's included within all these things? So let's see if we can answer this. First of all, what are the events that are described in these cosmological uh, words. First, you've got things having to do with the bodies of the heavens. You have reference to uh, all the tribes of the earth mourning, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. We'll see the description of the sending out of the angels with the great sound of a trumpet and gathering the elect. Now let's notice, in this same discourse, when we get to chapter 25, verse 31, here it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. Now most of us probably wouldn't take that figuratively. Now the question is, in the same discourse, where is the clear indication? Well, take this figuratively, but this is literal. Uh, in the same gospel, when Jesus is for the high priest, he will say in chapter 26, verse 64, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now I've heard some brethren, I think perhaps because of what we wrestle with in chapter 24, say, okay, well, that, maybe that's of eighty seventy. Well, I tend to take it very, fig, very literally. And the question is, would you have Jesus... And Matthew, in the same discourse, without some clear indication, or in the same gospel, use that same language without giving us a clear indication that one should be figurative, one should be literal. Now, let's take that even further. In the rest of the New Testament, we'll talk about this a few times this morning, Paul will connect Jesus coming on the clouds with the angels, the last trumpet, the final judgment, and he'll use that word parousia of Christ. Peter will associate the end of the universe and cosmological events with the parousia of Jesus in 2 Peter chapter 3. Is it figurative there? Now most of us, I think, would say no, but if we're going to take, be consistent, how can we argue? John, I think, absolutely echoes the wording in Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 that we see in Matthew chapter 24 Verse 30, Before, behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn for him. Is that figurative? I know some I've heard say, well, that must be 
And, and here's what happens. If we're not careful, what we begin to do is little by little, all these passages that seem to define and explain that there is a final judgment, if we begin to rationalize and spiritualize them all away, what's left? And that's where the 80, 70 folks end up. I want us to think a little bit about this. It seems most reasonable to me that Jesus uses language in the Olivet Discourse to describe these events. And what then happens is that language becomes the antecedent for the later teaching that you'll find in the rest of the New Testament. Now, you may say, okay, well, what about the term immediately, immediately after? We don't have time this morning, but I've done some writing recently that was featured in Truth Magazine, and it's actually in the appendix of the study guide as well, uh, in which I talk some about this transition verse question and look in depth at this word that's translated immediately. And uh, I'd urge you to look at that. What you'll see is that the word essentially means straight away, and sometimes it's even used as a narrative device just talking about the next thing. It's it not inherently something that communicates smallness, and I think that's important for us to understand. But what about all these things? That's what many of us, I think, wrestle with here. And what we're looking at is verse 34 says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And the, the conclusion is that must mean that everything that was said before it has to have already occurred. Now, we've already... I've already thrown out some challenges to that. We also noted that Jesus is talking about things that they won't see or that they will see that don't signal the end. The abomination of desolation is the one thing he said they could see that answered the question. Have you ever noticed the verse right before this? Verse, 20, verse 33 right before it says, So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. Now notice that. I, I emphasize there this is talking about, the, all these things, is talking about things they would see. We can't include unseen, figurative, spiritual things within what verse 34 describes as the all these things that they would see. Now, what about the sign part? How does the Lord answer that in the discourse? Well, it's interesting, the first times that it's used in Matthew and Mark, it's actually speaking of signs that the false prophets would carry out. Luke will use it of uh, signs in the heavens a couple of times. I wonder if you've ever noticed, and I hadn't until I re looked really closely at this, that only Matthew really offers the word sign in any kind of direct way responding to their question. And let's notice what we, uh, what we see regarding that. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, look at this and notice something. Is there a sign that precedes this? No. The sign is the Son of Man coming. And I think that is borne out in the next two places we see this word parousia used. And notice it'll be used uh, in reference to this comparison to the days of Noah. This is 24 verses 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming parousia of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming parousia of the Son of Man be. Now, I want us to think about this. Because most of us, I think, would look at this and say, well, uh, this is talking about his actual presence. Well, if that's the case, why would we say that these two verses are, but not verse 27 before verse 34? I think instead, um, as we see here, what it's talking about is uh, it can't be foreseen. It's not going to be something that you can predict. The sign will be his coming. I think that's emphasized in verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. The point is, be prepared. And I really think what follows echoes that. 
Because you'll see the parable of the fig tree, the parable of the faithful servant, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, all of which could apply to preparation, either for 8070, you're watching, so you can flee when that happens, or for final judgment. And I think Mark's wording in Mark chapter 13, verse 37, is a good summary of this whole idea. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. Now I have, I'm really out of time. Um, let me go ahead and just offer a few things very quickly, just to show that um, after the Olivet Discourse, I think we see this borne out. Because when this word parousia is used, Paul will use it, uh, to the Thessalonians. He will describe them as his joy and crown of rejoicing at his parousia. Uh, we'll see as well that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, he will pray that the Lord may establish their hearts blameless uh, at uh, his parousia coming. Is that talking about 87? No. We'll see as well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, uh, there where it will describe by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the parousia of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. We'll see Paul will pray in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the parousia of the Lord. Is that talking about 8070? No. We'll see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, uh, the, the idea as well. But let me point out something here in connection with what 1 Thessalonians will deal with. Because it will deal with the events connected with the coming or the parousia of the Lord. He'll bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. The Lord himself, his actual presence, will ascend from heaven. We'll see as well that uh, the dead in Christ will rise first. We'll see that the living will be caught up together to meet them in the clouds, uh, in the air. We'll see that they will always be with the Lord. And this idea, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. You know the first time that's ever referenced? In the Olivet Discourse, in the Mount of Olives Discourse. And we'll see this idea just throughout as Paul will connect Harusia with the final coming of of the Lord. Um, I think it's important to recognize as well that what this does is it echoes the very ideas in the Mount of Olives discourse where parousia is consistently used of that. An example of this comes in 2 Thessalonians with reference to the man of sin. Now whatever you think the man of sin is, you should notice that it uses parousia of the coming of the man of sin and parousia of the coming of the Lord to destroy him by the brightness of his parousia. And I think what we've got to conclude is that they both describe the actual presence of both the Lord and the man of sin. Peter will use parousia first of his first coming and then of his second coming. Those who doubt, where's the promise of his parousia? And we'll see here, I think we can't argue that one's actual, one's figurative. Uh, it will be used in Peter He'll echo the destruction of the heavens, uh, and he'll connect that with uh, the same things that are found in the Olivet Discourse. And Peter will use this idea as well of him coming as a thief. I think what becomes clear is that they are using it in exactly the same way that the Lord used it. Now, I'm out of time. There are some points further in the book that I'd urge you to take a look at that not only show some other examples where it's used, but in the writings right after the New Testament, we see the very same idea. They're applying this wording from the Mount of Olives discourse to what they were still expecting. So as we began and we talked about the different ways that this is viewed, I think we've got to reject an idea that this is talking about uh, something in the distant future that hasn't yet happened. I think as well we must reject the view that would argue that this is just talking about AD 70. I think the only reasonable conclusion is that he's moving back and forth, and he's talking about both. Now, that transition verse view, I, I know that many of you probably hold to that view, but I would argue that because of what we've seen with the meaning of parousia, with the use of this language, not only in the rest of the New Testament, but throughout the discourse, the only reasonable conclusion is to see that he is 
alternating, talking about the two to contrast them and to urge preparation and readiness. We don't know when the day of the Lord will come, but we need to be prepared. Thank you for your kind attention. more time and I'm also certain you've got questions that you would like to ask and that means this afternoon was it 2 30 yes, that we are reassembling for our question and answer session uh, we'll have Dan King Kyle and also Bruce Reeves on the stage with brother uh, Steve Wolfgang uh, fielding questions and so if you do have questions about this presentation or other issues that are discussed in the course of this. This will give it a time for friendly dialogue and discussion and perhaps even further explanation. Uh, we will be splitting in just a moment for the two men and women tracks. Uh, if you're interested in watching on uh, live stream uh, on the uh, YouTube channel, uh, the women's will be available. Just go search for for CEI bookstore, CEI bookstore or Truth Publications, and you can see the women's channel that will be broadcast for those that are viewing remotely. And then the same uh, live stream will be still available at truthlectures.com and at the uh, Facebook page. Let's take about a five minute break or so and try to be back in here if you're in, gonna be in the men's session for Brother Danny Dow's session uh, that will commence at the top of the hour. Thank you. <laughs> 